This is one of the classic episodes that people still write to me about on social media and sometimes when someone catches me in the wild and the field, they want to talk about cannibalism. How do you protect yourself against the people that want to talk cannibalism with you? I'm an open book in a meadow on a sunny day, man. AMA. That's how I treat it. It's weird though, right? Like it's it's such a... In many cases, it is a cultural and social taboo for most, but not all, of societies throughout history in the world. And the thing that I, I think continually fascinates me here are the different types of cannibalism we encounter. And Matt, I don't know if we asked this question uh, in the episode, but one of the big one of the big questions I had uh, was whether eating one's fingernails counts as cannibalism, or whether you know uh, when like kids eat their boogers, not to be too crass, is that cannibalism? I mean, it's not flesh, flesh. Mm. Mm-hmm. I don't think it counts. Oh, or eating hair. <laughs> eating hair. I I don't know. We're in in this episode. We're really just talking about you know the flesh parts, the mm-hmm. stuff under the skin, the meat that we're all made of, and eating that because it, usually because you have to resort to it sometimes because it's part of a ritual. Let's learn about cannibalism together right now. From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. I am Noel. They call me Ben. Hopefully you have a name as well. Welcome to Stuff They Don't Want You To Know. Ladies and gentlemen, as Timothy Leary used to say, turn on, tune in, drop out of the mainstream malarkey. Uh, have we got a show for you? You know what I say, Ben? What's that? Malarkey schmalarkey. That's true. You have said that often. <laughs> yeah, you know what I always say. <laughs> What's that? Don't eat other humans. But is it wrong to eat people? I think so. In our modern society, sure. You guys, we're not here to make judgment calls, okay? We're here to report mm-hmm. the facts and the, you know, conjectures surrounding said topic. Yes, that is correct, Noel. We are looking at cannibalism, fact and fiction today. As Matt pointed out just a second ago, cannibalism is a taboo. It is a great and it's an ancient taboo, but it is also a practice that is as old as human civilization, older than Western civilization, as old as the passage of the stars first measured by man. It may predate civilization. There is evidence that human beings, uh, you know, we did our earlier show on the different let's say, demo reels of what would become modern humanity, Denisovans, Mm -hmm. Neanderthals, uh, the hobbits out in Indonesia. There's evidence that... I thought they lived in New Zealand. New Zealand? (laughs) Oh, that was the worst. I've been working... I had a pretty good New Zealand accent for a while. You should watch Hunt for the Wilder People. You'll get Mm -hmm. it real quick. You know, Flight of the Concords helped me with it. Some of the same folks. Some of the same folks? Mm -hmm. No kidding. Mary. Mary's in it. Mary? He plays a uh, conspiracy theory nut who lives in the bush. <laughs> it's on It's on the top of my must-see list. It's fantastic. List. Yeah. Always. All right. But we digress. Oh, yes. We'll check Me, it out. Me, rather. No, we're all we're all digressing together. And what what else is a conversation if not a series of Matryoshka dolls, you know? Uh, so there is evidence, though, that even before the uh, Homo sapien that we know now was on the scene – Early man was eating itself. Yeah, there's this place called Goes Cave in Somerset, England. And in this cave, there were discovered animal bones and human bones that were placed together. Uh, it's from 15,000 years ago. That's when these, these bones were placed in there. The bones displayed evidence of defleshing, the skin ripping off of it, marrow extraction, like crushing those bones and mm, getting all the good insides delicious out. Delicious marrow. And get this, human teeth marks on both mm-hmm. animal and human bones. Which is, uh, which is horrifying, but still not quite proof positive 
of cannibalism, I mean, obviously it's damning evidence, but, uh, there, the only, the only proof positive we have of cannibalism is actually found in human feces mm. because there is a, uh, a protein that can only come from human flesh that will end up in human feces if someone has eaten someone else. You like how we're, uh, we're, we're getting right to the grossest part. Yeah. This is, this is great. I'm loving this, especially <laughs> I'm imagining all the different things that people could be doing while listening to this. That's actually the tagline for cannibalism is I'm loving this. Yeah. Yeah. McDonald's took it. Oh, to I'm loving it, but we can't get sued for that, right? We're good. No, we changed the word. Okay, yeah, cool, we changed cool. the word. Uh, the same way Vanilla Ice took that uh, Queen song. Oh God, remember? He did get sued, though. Yeah, he did. Yeah, did he win? I don't know. Oh, so let's put this in the historical context. The fancy five dollar word for cannibalism is anthropophagy. And my girlfriend loves their clothes, but I find them really overpriced. At the yeah. Oh, boy. <laughs> and they keep eating their customers, right? Yeah, not cool. I feel so worried about you every time you go into that store. I try, I try to avoid it at all costs. <laughs> so here's here's the, the deal with cannibalism. For a long, long time, accusations of cannibalism have been used to dehumanize groups of other people, Right. Cristobal Colón, street named Christopher Columbus, uh, rationalized some horrific things he did to the natives of the Caribbean by saying that he was bringing Christianity to cannibals or that he was, you know, stopping their acts through uh, somehow slavery and mass pillaging and rape. But yeah, well, yeah he also said that uh, the native peoples that he met mm-hmm. when he landed Mm-hmm. The Arawak, I think, is the name of the the tribe in North America, and they they told him, or allegedly they told him that there was a, another group that was outside of theirs that practiced cannibalism. And hey, Christopher, you should be careful; those guys don't go near them. And they were really doing him a solid. He really did not pay it forward. No, he said, "Great move, new slaves." But there, yeah, but there was also no evidence. Or there has been no evidence to show that that mm-hmm. was true. Right. So we see that cannibalism is one of the ultimate um, accusations. Yeah, it certainly can exist almost as like a specter where people are suspected of doing a thing and mm-hmm. you kind of like there's this lingering, you know, do they, don't they? Well, we've heard they did, so we better steer clear, you know, mm-hmm. that kind of thing. Right. Or or we, our community, is acting in self-defense rather than aggression. Legends of adjacent cannibal groups are across six of the seven continents, unless something's going on in Antarctica that we are not aware of at this time. But we do know that this great debate is, uh, aside from that sociopolitical context, we do know that cannibalism does occur. As Matt pointed out, it occurred repeatedly and often in ancient times. Uh, it also, re- it also occurs in, uh, the past, in the recent past. Recent enough that people you know, including maybe yourself, depending on when you were born, were alive when acts of cannibalism occurred. And it also occurs in isolated incidents via individuals. So our question today will be how prevalent is cannibalism? How much of this stuff is a rumor? How much of it is fact? And to do that, we're going to lean on an article at our parent website, How Stuff Works. And you can check it out now. Uh, it's How Cannibalism Works. Written by Josh Clark of Stuff You Should Know. Oh, yeah, that's right. Josh wrote this one. That guy's into some freaky stuff. <laughs> He sure is, Noel. Uh, hey, Noel, what's the first type of cannibalism? Well, I'm glad you asked, Ben. It just so happens the first type of cannibalism is what's known as survival cannibalism. So this is sort of a Donner Party-esque kind of situation. So consuming human flesh in the hopes of surviving long enough to eat something else. So not for funsies. Not for funsies. Unfortunately, sometimes that time for eating other things, delicious nuggets, chicken nuggets, whatever, Mm. never comes. So you end up kind of, you know, exhausting your... Uh, your buddies <laughs> in the form of, you know, digesting their flesh. And then you're left to starve and also feel like a terrible, monstrous human person. Yes, here's an example. 
In the 1800s, four men on a yacht named the Mignonette were sailing from England to Australia, and they were stranded in a lifeboat after their yacht sank in the Atlantic. They were adrift for more than two months, and they uh, they captured one sea turtle. And ration it as they could, they eventually ran out of meat. One of the men was a sailor named Richard Parker, and he got so desperately thirsty that he drank seawater. And, of course, his health declined more precipitously than his three surviving shipmates. As he lingered between death and life with morbidity looming in front of him, the shipmates said, we'll kill him and eat him rather than waiting for him to die of natural causes. And there's a brutal logic to that as well mm-hmm. that we can explore. I'm, I'm just going to really quickly point something out here, and it just struck me. Mm-hmm. Have you guys seen Life of Pi? Yes. I'm uh, aware of it. I've not seen it. Yeah. Isn't the tiger's name Richard, Richard Parker? Parker? Yes. <sighs> huh? And they're like stranded on a ship. Spoiler alert. Mm-hmm. It's, it's not really a spoiler so much as like the whole movie. Right? Uh, yeah. Dang it. All right. Sorry. But that's. Interesting. Mm-hmm. I didn't yeah. realize that. And The Life of Pi, which is a wonderful book, and uh, I, I was a fan of the film as well. We see the shipwreck situation repeated in fiction. Unfortunately, this fiction is based on fact because for a very long time, it was a code of the sea. It was understood that if people were stranded in a shipwreck, mm-hmm someone may well end up being consumed by the other people. And oddly enough, another twist here is uh, for fans of Edgar Allan Poe and the paranormal, around the same time, roughly, Edgar Allan Poe wrote a short story called The Narrative of Arthur Gordon Pym. He wrote that in 1838, and that's Pym, P-Y-M, which follows almost exactly the real life story of Richard Parker. Is it synchronicity? Is it a Jungian super consciousness? Is it, so did he hear about it maybe? And then wrote about it? Did he hear about it before it happened? Or did he he do it it to them? (laughs) Or did he somehow do it to them? But speaking of the ritual, uh, what is it? The ritual of the sea or the, um, the code of the the code of the sea. I've got three straws here, boys. I don't think we've reached that place yet I'm we can find out it. we can find out who's gonna eat who you're gonna eat me guys they're the same size no what? no they're not what take your best Ooh, shot. ben got the short straw you have to kill him is there a hierarchy here because you got the long straw you- <laughs> and wait and you brought the straws <laughs> I out brought the straws out but hey you picked <laughs> you chose there's another example that happened more recently and listeners this may have occurred in your lifetime This may sound familiar to you. There was a plane crash in 1972 of 42 people, included uh, a Uruguayan rugby team, which is probably the reason you may have heard of this before. It got the story of this event got turned into a movie called Alive, uh, also a book. Uh, There are several places where you can read about this. And a sweet Pearl Jam song. Oh, yeah. Kidding. I don't know if they're related. So keep in mind, it's minus 30 degrees Fahrenheit out there. That's super cold. Um, now you've got a lot of people who didn't make it through the initial crash. Their bodies are there. Um, you don't have much to eat because, of, you know, they had some supplies, some wine and chocolate that was on the plane, but it was very limited. And there was also an avalanche that they had to deal with that ended up killing eight more of the surviving people that were they there. They killed half of the survivors, eight yeah. of the 16. The bodies of some of the people who are here that are frozen, or do we die? Do we all just decide to die? That's a tough choice to make, and they made it. They, and they were ultimately rescued. Yes, uh, they were driven to desperation after uh, 70 to 72 days, and they took a sort of a Hail Mary, 10-day trip to find some sort of civilization. And they ran into a uh, Chilean herder, I believe, who brought them back. Uh, this kind of cannibalism is, uh, you know, it's frightening. And we drew straws in jest, but were the three of us on a boat and in desperate circumstances, who knows what would occur? And Matt, I think you're right. 
it is it is a tough decision and I don't mean to denigrate it at all but also it's a decision that I feel like I know most people I I know what most people would decide very very few people including you vegetarians in the audience would slowly starve to death and the worst part about this kind of cannibalism is that it encounters rabbit starvation rabbit starvation is something that happens when someone's diet is only lean meat so when people are driven to cannibalism in this sort of situation the person that they are consuming unless they were already dead if everybody was starving and they just ate the first one who expired from starvation or dehydration then the food that they are eating from that body is not nutritious enough to sustain them. There's no fat. So they will continue eating while they are starving because their body has enough lean meat. What it needs is some sort of nutrition. So the the worst part of this sort of cannibalism, unfortunately, is that it doesn't help. And that is rabbit, R-A-B-B-I-T, starvation? Yes, yeah. Okay. Uh, so we talked about the, um, we talked about the code of the sea. We talked about survival cannibalism in small groups, but it has happened in large scale events as well. Uh, most notably for history buffs, the siege of Leningrad, perhaps. This was a nearly three year siege, 872 days. A million people died easily. Uh, from various circumstances, right? From war, from hardship, from being abducted, butchered, and eaten. The population was slowly starving with no way to re replenish the food supply. Gangs of starving people roamed the street like feral dogs. The city had to dedicate an entire unit of its dwindling law enforcement just to fight cannibalism. Mm. And people were arrested, hundreds of people. Yeah, as a matter of fact, 260 people were arrested for cannibalism, and uh, the parents kept their children inside at night for fear that they would be abducted. Absolutely. No, this shows us that people will eat one another, not just in small, isolated groups, but entire cities can be driven to cannibalism under the right circumstances. If this seems strange to you, ladies and gentlemen, look around. Is there anyone in the room with you? Are you outside? Is there anyone walking by? If there's no one near you, think about the closest person. Think about what would happen the next time you're trapped in an elevator, right? Think about what would happen the next time you're stranded somewhere. How long would it take you? What choice would you make? And we will ponder that question and others when we return from a quick sponsor break. So our second type of cannibalism is what's called learned cannibalism, essentially a socially reinforced form of uh, form of eating human flesh. And there are two types of this. Yeah, there is endo cannibalism, and that's one that occurs within the group, the social group in which you exist. And right. there are yeah. several examples of this. Most of the examples we have are tribes, mm -hmm. um, tribes in Indonesia and New Guinea, mm -hmm. uh, several other places like that. This is what you might describe as ritualistic cannibalism, perhaps? Yeah, for sure. Uh, so like the Wari tribe, uh, practices Indo cannibalism in the, tr in the form of, uh, mortuary cannibalism. Mm -hmm. Uh, th they're also known as the Paca Nova and they are in Brazil. And so this sort of cannibalism occurs when they – so what happens is when a, when a valued member of the society dies, the closest relatives hug, embrace the deceased person. They leave the body for three days approximately, and then they send out messengers. So mm -hmm. in the time between the death and the actual funeral, it's an average of three days, but that's not a hard and fast rule. And, of course, this is in the Amazon, so decomposition sets in very quickly. It is a hungry, hungry environment. Uh, and once they arrive, once all the relatives arrive, 
they build a fire, they remove the visceral organs, they roast the body, and then they have attendant relatives consume the flesh to assuage the family's grief. Because what, what they thought, what they think thought of this is that by ingesting this corpse, the dead person is living on in some way in the body of their family. Yeah, like transferring memories over. Mm -hmm. And transferring the soul rather than being abandoned to wander the forest alone as a spirit. So it's considered an act of compassion Mm -hmm. rather than an act of desperation. And in its own way, you know, the, the reasoning behind that is beautiful. And then there is the foray tribe in Papua New Guinea, which you have probably heard of if you have looked into cannibalism. So upon uh, the death of a member of this community, the women in the family, the maternal kin, dismember the corpse, remove the arms and feet, strip the limbs, remove the brain, cut open the chest, and take out the organs. This is where um, this is where you hear about Kuru. Right. I've heard of this. Yeah. So Kuru is this infection you can get from consuming a human brain. Yeah. Is this from the prions? Mm-hmm. Like, um, like mad, mad cow. cow. Yeah. And, uh, so this, uh, the, the thing is that people who died of Kuru, there was a bit of a positive feedback loop because those people would die, um, quickly. Right. Mm-hmm. And they would have still have a layer of fat on them that resembled fatty pork. Mm. So they would be choice bites. And this, this produced, um, you know, this produced massive complications. There's also an X-Files episode about people transmitting Kuru to each other. Uh, and then there's another tribe in, uh, Indonesian New Guinea. Yeah. This is the Korowai tribe and the practices of the Korowai tribe in the past that's what we're talking about here. It appears that most of cannibalism within this tribe has ceased. Um, but in the past, when a member of the tribe died for some less than obvious reason, let's say a disease, something internal that you couldn't see, they didn't fall out of a tree or, you know, die in battle or get attacked by an animal. If this occurs, then it was believed that their death was caused by a kakua or a witch man from the netherworld, which is pretty intense. I think that's also a Pokemon. A Kakua? Mm-hmm. I did not know that. Really? Listeners, correct me if I'm wrong. Okay. <laughs> but these Kakua were only believed to be able to inhabit the bodies of a male, another male. And when they did inhabit that body, they magically ate the interior of the human. So in order to enact revenge on this witch man that is eating the insides... The core, I believe they had to eat the body of the person who died. And uh, there's this whole list here of how they prepared the meat, which I kind of don't even want to get into. But they basically steamed the body and chopped it up uh, in order to consume all the parts. And we have a description here from an interview that Vice conducted with someone who spent some time with this tribe that discusses exactly how they prepared the human meat. Just for the record, the Pokemon is a Kakuna. But here's the quote. They steam everything with an oven made from leaves and rocks. They treat it like they would the flesh of a pig. They cut off the legs separately and wrap them in banana leaves. They cut off the head, and that goes to the person who found the Kakua. They cut off the right arm and the right ribs as one piece and the left as another. They eat everything except for the hair, nails, and the penis. Children under 13 are not allowed to eat this flesh. They believe that eating the kakua is very dangerous, that there are evil spirits all around, and the children are vulnerable. And again, this is these are practices that occurred in the past. It's thought that now these practices are discussed as a way of getting people to come and visit the tribe. It's like uh, a to tourism bring tourism thing? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, that is unconfirmed currently. There's another one uh, that's perhaps the oldest practice of cannibalism, which is exo-cannibalism, eating a member of another family, group, community, tribe, culture, Mm etc. For instance, the Myanmar in Papua New Guinea, again, uh, were well known for practicing this. Uh, They would raid neighboring villages when an anthropologist questioned members of this community why they carried off dead Atbulmans, an adjacent community, uh, 
they said they considered them good meat. Hmm. To this tribe, the Miamans, the Atbal Mens, who existed outside of their community, weren't people. Mm-hmm. They were game. Yeah. They were there to be hunted the same way that the Morlocks hunted the Eloy in the time machine by H.G. Wells. Or the way Gary Busey hunted Ice T in Most Dangerous Game. Most Dangerous <laughs> Game. Well, that wasn't what it was called. I think the movie was just called, it was called Surviving the Game. Yeah. Hunting a person, though, is often referred to as the most dangerous game. There's another example. There was a former secret society in Sierra Leone calling themselves the Leopard Society. They would kill people. They would attack them. Mm-hmm with uh claw like weapons and uh they would take the human blood and fat of killed members of other groups and they would mix it into a potion called borfina. It was consumed to attract wealth and power, similar to a few of those isolated incidents amongst uh narco religions. Yeah, with Gandolle and, and all that. Yeah. And uh you know, of course while we're in that part of the world, while we're in South America Let's, uh, let's look at the Aztec culture of Mexico and Central America, just a little ways north, right? Uh, there were large scale human sacrifices to appease the gods, to, uh, attend the gods' needs in hopes of gaining greater glory, a valuable harvest, and so on. Ritualistic sacrifice and harvesting is something that we can examine in a later podcast, but there was also cannibalism that occurred. And this is not necessarily something from the bygone days of civilizations that have fallen. In World War II, when some of our uh, ancestors, right, were traveling across the world waging war, when some of uh, our listeners today might have been traveling in one part of a war effort or another, cannibalism occurred especially in the Pacific theater. And this is, um, this is recent. This is horrific. We see that wartime cannibalism is almost its own thing. You know, it, it can occur in survival situations like the siege of Leningrad, but we've categorized it in a different way when there is an attacking military force that is engaging in cannibalism, not because it needs to, not because it is looking for nutrition, but because of the madness of war. Yeah. It's called battle rage in a couple of places, um, specifically with Iroquois and Fiji cultures. Mm-hmm. It's, it's one of these awful things where people, if they were captured, they would be mutilated, like in front of a crowd sometimes, sometimes cut up and eaten in front of a crowd. As- well, you know, like people t- talking about taking su- like souvenirs or trophies where someone will have like a necklace with, you know, severed ears on them or something like that, you know? Mm-hmm. And while we're talking about this stuff, this darker stuff, let's move to pathological cannibalism, which is the... Maybe one of the, it's difficult to make a hierarchy for this, so mm-hmm. I won't attempt it, but pathological cannibalism, pathological cannibalism is what mentally disturbed individuals will do. And for instance, well, let's name the elephant in the room. We're talking about serial killers. Mm-hmm. We're talking about Albert Fish. We're talking about Jeffrey Dahmer, who uh, famously practiced cannibalism on some of his victims, uh, and I believe he uh, tried to conduct trepanation operations in order to create undead uh, slaves. Whoa. Yes. And this, this is the reason it's pathological is because this is not a um, survival situation. This is not a socially reinforced thing or a, a, a ritual or a fu- funereal rite, you know. This is uh, a person who is disturbed uh, acting out on their own inner demons, right, acting out on the orders of their own inner demons. And then there's another case here, of course, that uh, some of us may remember uh, from 2001, which uh, we have a quote here from an advertisement 
well-built men, 18 to 30, who would like to be eaten by me. Mm. This was an ad taken out by uh, a guy named Armin Males, M-E-I-W-E-S. Uh, he was looking for someone to consensually be consumed. He found a willing partner in 43-year-old Bernd Jürgen Brands. This was a little bit different. It's still pathological cannibalism, but mm-hmm. but it was a consenting partner. So, over the next uh, over the next few months after they met and they first ate pieces of this guy, uh, his um his man parts, yeah, his genitalia. Um, after they ate the genitalia, uh, Armin put the guy in a bath. While he's bleeding, slit his throat, butchered him, and over the next few months ate uh, about 45 pounds of Jeez. his dead body. So it wasn't really a crime, but it does lead us to, or in terms of, in legal terms, yes. in German courts. There was consent. This wasn't, there, who would make a law for that? Who saw that coming? No yeah. one. Yeah. That's a Shyamalan move for sure. I. Uh, this leads us to another form of cannibalism, which would be auto cannibalism. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, do any of you bite your nails? Yes. Do any of you, uh, let's, uh, we're continuing to be a little crass and gross with this. Does anyone pick their nose or eat their boogers or, uh, chew on the edge of their fingers or yes. eat their hair? Gross. If so, Sorry. you are committing an act of auto cannibalism. This makes me think of a story um, from, I believe, the Skeleton Crew collection of Stephen King short stories called Survivor Type, where a doctor um, finds himself stranded alone on a desert island and has his medical bag and anesthesia and systematically, methodically anesthetizes different parts of his body and, um, you know, cuts them off and eats them until he has no limbs left. Whoa. That's that's great, Stephen King. Thanks. Thanks for putting that in my head. And then there's what, in my opinion, and I want to hear what you think, folks. Uh, in my opinion, the most horrific form of cannibalism is forced auto-cannibalism, forcing someone to eat themselves. Yeah. Like that scene in Hannibal. Yes. All right, we're entering a little bit of spoiler territory here, so if anyone hasn't seen the movie Hannibal from, what, 10 years ago? Um, the well, sequel. Years, fast forward about... Uh, a minute and a half. There's a scene in this film where um, Anthony Hopkins' character, Hannibal Lecter, um, has... Isn't it has a brain open? Yeah. Like, skulls yeah, cut open? Yeah. Ray Liotta's character, who's sort of his nemesis in the movie, um, he abducts him, lobotomizes him, and cuts out little parts of his brain and fries it up in a pan and then feeds it to him. And stuff wow. like this happens in the real world. I want to warn you before we continue, folks, uh, that this may not be a pleasant story. So if you would rather not hear it, this is your chance to turn back. We'll keep it short. This really happened, and it's important not to forget that these things occur. In 1934, in Jackson County, Florida, a group of around 2,000 white Southerners intended to sacrifice a man named Claude Neal, an innocent black man, They sent invitations about this. They announced it in local newspapers. They castrated him, and they forced him to eat his own testicles. Mm. And then they tortured, further mutilated him, cut off other parts of his body. Some saved his mementos, similar to wartime cannibalism, skinned him, and burned him. This is what the human species is capable of. Forced auto cannibalism is, in my opinion, the most insane and disturbing part of, of this entire thing. And then as a palate cleanser, let's go right to, uh, one, another one that a lot of people don't think about. Newly discovered auto cannibals, Matt and I among you, nail biters, right? Mm-hmm. There's another, there's another thing. And that is symbolic cannibalism. You attend a uh, Christian mass. Body of Christ. Body of Christ. Yeah, this is something I, I can't remember if we've talked about on the show before, but it was a new revelation for me. And be, I guess just because I grew up in such a Christian-centric environment that I never thought 
twice about that ritual. Um, you know, it is symbolic, of course. You're not actually eating blood or body of anything. But still, even though it's symbolic. Now, some sects of Christianity do believe that it is the actual body of Christ once it is. Blessed uh-huh, in that way. Transubstantiation. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's mind blowing when you really think about it. Sure. From an outsider perspective, it's, mm-hmm. it's got to sound, you know, like cannibalism. Mm-hmm. And it just seems it's, it's so strange how things can normalize for people. You know what I mean? Sure. It's like if we think back to individuals in a human sacrifice oriented culture, then they would say, well, we have to do this. Well, that's sort of the nature of ritual, isn't it? Where you normalize the abnormal and it becomes, of course we do that. That's right. just what we do. We've always, we've done, that. always done that. We've always been at war with East Asia or oh, the Middle East or it. whomever. Uh, so here's the, here's the crazy part. This is a brief check in because we're, we're running out of time today and we'll have to come back next week. Cannibalism occurs in modern contexts. It occurs in West Africa. It occurs in India. It occurs in Papua New Guinea. It occurred in North Korea during the uh, famine of the 1990s. Cannibalism is much, much closer than you may think. It is not just some old, unfortunate happenstance with shipwrecks. It's not just something that an isolated, disturbed individual would do to innocent people. In times of crisis, people, no matter how well you know them, may change. And ultimately, the human goal, the thing we are built to do, is to survive by any means necessary. Not all of these forms of cannibalism that exist in the modern age are necessarily bad or criminal, right? There is ritualistic spiritual cannibalism, right? The propitiation of the dead, in, in other terms, for example, in India, there's the Aghori tribe, and these are cannibal monks. They feast on human flesh. They drink from skulls. They live amongst the dead, but they are not, um, they're not going out and killing people. They will chew the heads off live animals. They meditate on top of cadavers. They live with death. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Mm-hmm. But this is not necessarily criminal. Another thing that we see is the allegations of cannibalism amongst the elite. There are a lot of allegations of cannibalism among the elites, but there is not. I haven't found anything that we can substantiate, something that we can come forward and say, yes, absolutely, this is happening. Um, there are allegations about Bohemian Grove that you've probably read, where there are allegedly human sacrifices. Through that the occur, cremation of care. Through the cremation of care, where there's a body, you know, a it's believed to be just a, a prop. But an effigy. It, an effigy, yes. But, you know, there are people who think otherwise. Who knows? I've never been there. The only people I know have been there are presidents and, you know, some of the elites and Alex Jones. So we are going to end it here today, ladies and gentlemen, on a question. Would you... Eat someone's to survive. Do you have the willpower to let yourself slowly starve to death rather than consume human flesh? How prevalent do you feel cannibalism is? And what do you think about the spiritual nature of consuming human body parts? Yeah, do you think there is power to be gained by doing that somehow? Let us know. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We're Conspiracy Stuff on Facebook and Twitter. We're Conspiracy Stuff Show on Instagram. We got to the game kind of late, but you can see a lot of behind-the-scenes things that you wouldn't ordinarily see on our Instagram. If this podcast interests you, you can check out our related content on our website, StuffTheyDon'tWantYouToKnow.com, where we have every single podcast we've ever created. And that's the end of this classic episode. If you have any thoughts or questions about this episode, you can get into contact with us in a number of different ways. One of the best is to give us a call. Our number is 1-833-STDWYTK. If you don't want to do that, you can send us a good old-fashioned email. We are conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.